So Tom and Adolf, congenital heart disease specialist, but work in pulmonary hypertension. And um, thank you for inviting me to speak. So just briefly, I just want to cover a little bit about the classification and touch on the management of congenital heart disease associated with pulmonary hypertension. It's not uncommon, and it depends on the lesion, but in, in, on average, depending on the, um, the registry, up to 10% of patients with congenital heart disease have pulmonary hypertension. Um, in the classification of all types of pulmonary arterial hypertension, group one is the group which has the same type of pathology of um, smooth muscle and minimal proliferation, plexiform lesions, and they're the group that respond best to drug treatment. And so that includes idiopathic, connective tissue disease, and congenital heart disease. And within patients with congenital heart disease, you can kind of divide it up into different types of lesions. So the first group are those with a, a shunt or increased pulmonary blood flow at high pressures, such as systemic pressures. And I'm just, just touching on some terminology that we've already looked at is the idea of restrictive versus unrestrictive. So if a ventricular septal defect is large, you'll have unrestrictive flow to the pulmonary circulation, whereas if it's small, it'll be restrictive. Then there's also, so a, a VSD or a patent ductus arteriosus, there's high pulmonary blood flow at high, pul at high pulmonary pressures. Then you may have an atrial septal defect where you may just have high pulmonary blood flow then there's a third group of patients with cyanotic heart disease who essentially may, may have unrestricted pulmonary blood flow. And the last group that we don't see so much in adulthood is patients with pulmonary venous obstruction, so total anomalous pulmonary venous connection with restriction of the or a obstruction or hypoplastic left heart, and they'll develop pulmonary hypertension secondary to it. But the reason we don't see it so much in adulthood, if they have bad pulmonary hypertension, they don't survive to adulthood. And the group of patients we most commonly see in adulthood are those with shunts, and I'm going to spend most of my talk on those patients. So Eisenmenger syndrome David's talked about, it's a large shunt or a large defect resulting in high pulmonary blood flow, damage to the pulmonary circulation, and which ultimately results in a reversal in shunt, and that's associated with multi-organ problems. But these patients have a reasonable prognosis, I guess most surviving from in their 40s, 50s and 60s, even before the advent of advanced therapies. Um, so this was a guy who was 20, came over as a, a ref refugee, found to have a large ventricular septal defect, and he, he'd been, you know, played, played, with, you know, played soccer with his mates, uh, but wasn't too symptomatic. And he's got a, a, a large pressure-loaded right ventricle, and as David talked about before, this is the perimembranous ventricular septal defect. So if you look at the aorta and short axis, this is the perimembranous VSD, this is the doubly committed VSD, or the, and this is a subaortic. And you can see a large defect here with bidirectional flow. Now, which patients and with which types of shunts will develop pulmonary hypertension? Well, basically those at high, the defects which occur at high pressure, so a ventricular septal defect, uh, large patent ductus arteriosus are more likely to get a Eisenmenger syndrome, and similarly with truncus arteriosus. Interestingly, some patients with an atrial septal defect or sinus prognosis still develop it, and it's really hard to predict which ones will get it. Also, the timing of surgery to prevent Eisenmenger syndromes varies from patient to patient. So, for example, in truncus arteriosus, you really need to repair them very early in life, whereas a large ventricular septal defect, you may get away with it by about age two. However, a patient with a ventricular septal defect and Down syndrome really would need to be operated well within their first year of life. Now, what's this guy got? He's got clubbed cyanotic toes and pink non-clubbed fingers. So he's got a defect with right to left shunting below the arm. So he's, a, he's got a hypertensive patent ductus arteriosus or patent PDA with Eisenmenger syndrome. Second case is a woman of 26. She moved to Australia. She presented really very unwell with heart failure and was found to be 12 weeks pregnant. Now she's got a pressure-loaded right ventricle that's hypocontractile with a small high secondomatrial septal defect, too small to cause Eisenmenger syndrome with predominantly right to left shunting. So this is a person that we would say has a um, or she had a cardiac catheterization that showed poor cardiac output and very high pulmonary vascular resistance. So these are patients with 
defects that are too small to that you would uh, that are too small that you'd expect them to develop Isominga syndrome, and their clinical picture is more similar to idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And to date, they haven't been found to have the genetic abnormalities seen in familial uh, pulmonary hypertension. But you must think that there's more than one. There's a second insult here. The atrial septal defect that's small is a second insult to their pulmonary vasculature. Uh, the third case is another woman who was pregnant, uh, who presented late in pregnancy with mild breathlessness, was found to have very high pulmonary pressures, a remote history of VSD closure in childhood, and then had no cardiac follow-up since moving to Australia as a child. And she was, um, she was treated with pulmonary vasodilators in the latter part of pregnancy, anticoagulated, however, discharged on day 10 and presented uh, with very decompensated heart failure at day 12 with probably pulmonary emboli. So a very severely dilated hypocontractile right ventricle with pressure overload, with systolic septal flattening, and really high pulmonary pressures around 120. She survived and went on pulmonary vasodilator therapy and was adamant to have a second child, which she survived her second pregnancy, but now her pressures that had improved a lot are back up to the 100 range. Um, so this is a so the pulmonary hyper, arterial hypertension after corrective surgery is pulmonary hypertension that persists or even could recur late after uh, corrective surgery despite the absence of a significant shunt and their their prognosis is intermediate between those with Isomenga syndrome and idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Um, case four is a man with pulmonary atresia ventricular septal defect. This is where there's no pulmonary circulation in a number of patients and their pulmonary vasculature is supplied by collaterals of the aorta. And he was increasingly breathless. So there, the pulmonary, So if we have a look at his angiogram, he's got this unrestricted, this is a catheter up his right-sided aorta, or up his aorta, with unrestricted flow to the right lung, some diminutive flow to the left lung. So you could imagine this is a hypertensive segment of lung. This, the pressures over here probably aren't too bad, but diminutive blood flow. So this is what we call segmental pulmonary hypertension. And these patients also respond to pulmonary vasodilators, but the studies are small and they're quite a heterogeneous group of patients in that um, they, you know, they, no one patient is alike. Um, this is an interesting case. Um, this is a girl from... The Solomon Islands, she looks like she's got pulmonary hypertension with pulmonary pressures of 150. But not all what you think is pulmonary hypertension is pulmonary hypertension. Never forget looking for outflow tract obstruction. I've heard of patients that have been followed for years with pulmonary outflow tract obstruction and thought to have Isomenga syndrome or pulmonary hypertension. And this was treated by Ian with surgery and she's done fantastically. So um, how do we manage it? Um, before we get into medical management, there, in terms of Isomenga syndrome, there's the non-medical things. Avoid situations where you might worsen the right to left shunt. So volume depletion, peripheral vasodilation, such as sauna, spas, excessive antihypertensives. Avoid non-essential surgery, and certainly if they need surgery, do it at a centre with cardiac anaesthetists with expertise in this condition. Um, pregnancy is contraindicated, but there will be women who do get pregnant who need um, you know, you, you manage them and with pulmonary vasodilators and specialised uh, at specialised units with pulmonary vasodilators. In terms of medical therapy, um, the first randomised trial was this study looking at bocentin, which showed a benefit in patients with congenital uh, with Isomenga syndrome. So pulmonary vasodilators work, and this study looking at um, comparing patients with advanced therapies compared to a historical cohort without advanced therapies clearly do better. So in summary, we use all types of pulmonary vasodilators as you would for any patient with pulmonary hypertension, with the exception that if you've got a large shunt with right to left shunting, you tend to avoid an intravenous, like intravenous epiprostanol where you, you're pr putting that patient at risk of um, paradoxical embolus from an indwelling catheter. So briefly, transplant's pretty good, but these patients, say for a patient with Isomenga, you see them at 30, they might live to 50, so transplant's probably not a good option for that, that patient, but may be good later on in life. Um, surgery is contra contraindicated, meaning surgery to close the defect is contraindicated, but there's the rare patient where the pulmonary vascular resistance is borderline, where you may get away with a fenestrated closure treated with pulmonary vasodilators. 
Um, and in summary, we're going to see more of this and uh, it's a difficult group of patients to see, but understanding their pathology and knowing which patients may develop pulmonary hypertension will certainly help in screening. So thank you.